11.5. We will do some of the tests in the lab to use sweet sugar fermentation to differentiate of some bacteria grow in the different type of the median, um, then to see what type of the pH environments fit different type of the bacteria. Okay, so just one issue, most of the bacteria is neutrophile. This is easily understand. In our stomach, most of the time there is no bacteria survive because our stomach temp uh, pH is very low, is 1.5. There is one type of the bacteria will grow, Helicobacteria pylori, and we will mention in the lab why that bacteria will grow, okay? Very few bacteria grow in the stomach area because of the low pH. Now, this comes out another thing. So, bacteria used to maintain the internal pH near neutrality. And the plasma membrane is permeable for protein and exchange potassium for the proteins. So, they keep the balance. But I want to let mention there is a big challenge in the meat industry is called acid resistant bacteria. So what happened? Some of you may prefer, let's say this is a bee, a caucus. Lots of the plants, they have a hazard plant, a type of the proactive plant for keep the meat safe. You have a beef carcass. You know the beef carcass, just to you harvest on the surface, there is a lot of bacterial growth. Some of them are pasture, some of them are normal bacteria. If you spray with lactic acid, let's say 5%, this lactic acid is not going to kill everything. Some of the bacteria will survive. Okay, let's say some of the bacteria survive. What are going to happen? They become acid resistant. This is a big challenge. Once the acid resistant the bacteria has, even later on, you make a beef steak, you go ahead to cooking. These bacteria might be resistant to heat. Because they will generate a cross protection effect by activating on our slides called the heat shock protein. Just want to let you know, this is a big challenge. Now what are we going to do then? You're going to ask them, you're going to say, what are we going to do? We have to use lactic acid to do it. Then we have to prepare another antimicrobials, sometimes alkaline stuff, like pottery ammonia compounds, to do a rotation. If we stick to use one type of acid solution, the bacteria are very easy to become acid resistant. Okay? Now, if it's become a heat resistance, that means if you talk to internal temperature 65 degrees Celsius to become medium well done, we may have to increase the temper temperature a little bit, maybe to 67 or to 71, some range a little bit higher, okay? Because if you, you keep doing the same temperature, those resistant at the heat resistant bacteria will still be survive. So just want to let you know, they do happen in the bacteria is called the acid tolerance. Okay, that happens because they can pump out their protons out of the cell with exchange of the potassium. Typically, if you are keep using the same antimicrobials um, in the food processing. Okay, this is the temperature range. Same thing as a human being. Bacteria have their optimal temperature range to grow. Why? Because it's related to the, to the enzyme. And you know that. Our human being temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. 
And then we now gonna be higher than 38 degrees Celsius, which means 100.4 degree Fahrenheit. If we are higher than that, you will say you have a fever. Now, when you have a fever, you're not gonna eat very well. You don't have a good appetite because the enzyme in your body has been dysfunctional, more or less, okay, to some certain level. For the bacteria, it's the same. The high temperature inhibit enzyme. That's why the high temperature bacteria are not gonna grow very well. And for every bacteria, there is a minimum temperature required to grow. There is a maximum temperature. You cannot be higher than that. The bacteria are gonna die or they're not gonna grow. But they always have an optimal temperature. This is depends different type of the bacteria. This is a slide tells you we could categorize bacteria into different categories. The first one is cyclophiles. This one, we call it environmental bacteria. Usually it's in a deep ocean, like, like Antarctic Ocean. Those are very cold places we have cyclophiles. That grow usually below, I will say five or six degrees Celsius. Even they can grow a little bit below zero. That's usually the environmental bacteria. The second category is cyclotrons. This is the one, have an example, called Listeria monosatogenes. This is a major food of passenger in ready to eat meat, like hot dog, like frankfurter, like uh, daily meat. Why? Because the cyclotrons can grow in the refrigerator temperature. Uh, most of the time, we put some food, and we say, okay, we're gonna eat tomorrow. Let's put it in the refrigerator. Yes, most of the bacteria will not grow. Let's say E. coli, salmonella. However, the stereomorphotogenes will grow, and they grow very well. Those bacteria are cyclotrons. That caused a big problem for the cold chain of the uh, meat industry. Okay, so that's called cyclotrons. The next one we call it a mesophile. This is our most common passage, E. coli, salmonella, fit that category for the mesophiles, which is the optimal temperature below 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, the next one, thermophiles. That means some bacteria, a little bit resistant to the heat, like to grow in a very heat environment. The good example is bacillus. Okay, bacillus is thermophiles. Okay, the last one, hyperthermophiles. That one is also an environmental bacteria, which means they like an extremely heat temperature. Even you boring it, it will not cure. This is usually happened, a geobacillus we call it. That bacillus used to do a uh, as a standard to see the autoclave or some of the heat facility, whether it's still functional or not. And where are you going to find those bacteria? Original in hot spring, like Yellowstone. So hyperthermophiles, those are in hot spring, are very, uh, very specific places, like Yellowstone, you see those hot springs, those places you get isolation, those are hyperthermophiles. Okay? So these slides gave you a temperature range for the microbacterial growth. Sacrophiles, zero to 20 degrees Celsius. Sacrotrophs, zero to 35 degrees Celsius. Mesophile, commonly used, in calling the bacterial passion on our skin surfaces. 20 to 45 degrees Celsius. Thermophiles, 55, 85 degrees Celsius. Hyperthermophiles, 85, 113 degrees Celsius. Okay, the next one we want to mention is uh, water activity. So what is water activity? Water activity, uh, I will be very briefly here, uh, not going to be too much detail. I have another class for the chemistry, teaching the spring semester, we talk more detail about the water activity. First of all, you need to know, water activity, which means how 
much water is available for bacteria use. Okay? This is not equal moisture amount. It's tolerated sometimes, not equal. What is moisture amount? Water amount. Or we say how many water in foods, in a food product. This is the first thing you need to know. These are the two different concepts. They are not equal. What activity? How many water is available for bacteria to use? Moisture amount, water amount in the food. They tolerate it in certain type of the foods, but they are not exactly linear coloring. This is the first thing. Second, how we test the water activity? We're using AW to see that. What I P divided or P0, P divided by P0. That means a vapor pressure of a solution divided by a vapor pressure of pure water. Now the vapor pressure of a pure water is always 1.0. The vapor pressure of a solution is always between 0 to 1.0. Okay? What is the vapor pressure? This is the water. This is the atmosphere pressure, like this. The chemical inside of the water always has a tendency to flee away. Is that right? Always going to go away. This is called vapor pressure. When the vapor pressure equals atmosphere pressure, what happened? Growing, is that right? Now, atmosphere pressure, in, um, atmosphere pressure, for example, in Colorado, will be a little, little bit different from New York City. Why? In Colorado, the elevation is higher. Is that right? So usually you have a high elevation. Uh, usually we're going to have a lower atmosphere pressure. So the boiling temperature will be lower. Therefore, in some of the mountain, Rocky Mountain area in Colorado, maybe 80 degrees Celsius, you will be boring, the water will boil. Then you put a food there, it may not be killing bacteria, although it's boiled, is that right? So that's for the vapor pressure. Now, what do mean the vapor pressure of a solution? If I put salt there, let's say 5% of salt, what will happen? When you put a salt there, these type of chemicals will react with the protein, with the water, you know that. Then they will be trying to keep it, not let them flee away. So the vapor pressure will be decreased if we add a salt there. That's why the water activity in most of the solution in the lab, even in our gross media, will be lower than the vapor pressure of the pure water because there's more or less some of the chemical ingredients in the water. They will be reacted with the water molecule to grab them, don't let them flee away from the intersurface. So the vapor pressure will be decreased. Okay? 
So that is the vapor pressure of a solution. That's why it's always lower than pure water. So give you an example. It's like a hot dog. What's a what's a water temperature? Very high. Around the 0 0.995. Okay, a salami. Salami is a fermented, a little bit dry. That water activity might be 0 0.90. How about the raisin or those type of dry stuff, like a milk powder? Let's say we've got milk powder. You know that the milk powder is very dry, is that right? So what's the water activity? Might be 0 0.5. So you can see from here to here, which means the available water for bacteria to using is decreased. That's why this TR mass cytogenesis is a challenge for hot dog, but it may not be a challenge for milk powder. Okay, so that's some suggestive example, not necessary. Right now, there's always emergent pathogens that happen. But traditionally, we thought about a hot dog is a big risk because one activity is very high. Okay, there is a formula which is we talked about the relative humidity. That means a hundred to multiply by one activity. And I mentioned here pure water, one point zero, no water, zero, zero. And this one, the picture there, I already mentioned. That's called the automatic balance. Okay, if you put in a just steal the water, you're gonna burst it. If you put in a soft solution, it will shrink. Okay, so both will kill in the bacteria. Okay, next one. Based on the requirements of the bacteria with the salt, we can categorize bacteria to different category. Here we use a terminology called a halophile. So what is a halophile? which means bacteria can grow optimal with salt concentration more than 0 0.2 mole. What is 0 0.2 mole? What is mole? What is the molecular width of this one? Put this through, is that right? What is that one? 75.5. So add together equals what? Is that right? Then dissolve in water, one, one, li one liter. And you can, that's one more. Okay, that's one more. Because right here. So what is 0 0.2? Or is there much more about 0 0.2? How much? About like 17 gram probably. So th that's around, you know. What means ext uh, extreme halophiles, more than two more? Okay, where are we gonna find those bacteria? Can survive high salt concentration. Did you ever go Great Salt Lake City in the state of Utah? If you go Great Salt Lake, most of the bacteria there is halophiles, okay? So halophiles, a good example, is a bacteria in the Great Salt Lake in the state of Utah. And, uh, and I will tell you, in our lab, there is a one bacteria it is a little bit halophile, which is the one you used already in Staphylococcus aureus. That's the reason Staphylococcus aureus can grow on our skin. Remember, we have salt in our skin. Is that right? If you're running 100 meters, you're swearing, uh, sweating, then what you find? When it's dried out, you see these crystal there? It's soft. So, Staphylococcus aureus is a little bit of Okay, this is we're going to talk about the oxygen amount, oxygen requirements. Uh, all our slides make it a little bit complicated, so I want to make sure these three things you understand, and then we go some deeper. This is the oxygen requirement for bacterial growth. First of all, you should know, some of the bacteria must 
grow in the presence of oxygen. We call aggregate aerobic bacteria, like pseudomonas. Some of the bacteria cannot survive in the presence of oxygen. If you have oxygen there, they die. That is called streak and anaerobic bacteria. Let's say clostridia. And the most of the bacteria, it can grow with or without oxygen. But it grows better with oxygen. That is called facultative aerobic. Or just say facultative bacteria. This is the first three categories you need to know before we move on to all these type of complicated terminology. Okay. Now, then the question is, why some of the bacteria must use oxygen? Why some of the bacteria cannot survive in the presence of oxygen? This is very simple. During a metabolic pathway, let's say a very simple NAD, uh, electron transport chain, go to FAD, we'll mention again, okay, in that case, go to uh, COQ, then go to cytochroma uh, C, then go to cytochroma B, maybe go A, A3, and finally go oxygen. During this electron transport chain process, sometimes the bacteria will generate toxication material. Let's say H2O2, let's say O3, or others, or many others. This is just give you two examples. Then the bacteria must have something, most of the time is the enzyme, to destroy them. If those are continually accumulated, it will be cause bacteria to die. So, depends on what they have. If the bacteria has catalyst, then this guy could be hydrolyzed, become water, and oxygen, if bacteria has catalyst. If bacteria has sulfide dasmutase, okay, that's called sulfide dasmutase, then O3 could become O2 and O1. They could the hydrolyze O3 become oxygen. Therefore, the bacteria can survive. Now, for obligate Arabic for pseudomonas, they must have something happen right here. That's called oxidase. Okay? They can transfer electrons to the oxygen, then they can survive. That's why they must have the oxygen. But for some other bacteria, like Crossidium, they do not have SOD. They do not have Catalysts. Therefore, they cannot survive with oxygen. Because the oxygen is there, they will generate toxication material. We can dissolve it. Okay, so a little bit tricky there. Why is there a different category? Depends on the enzyme. Now, why our slides have so many categories? Why? Because it depends. Some of the bacteria has also SOD. Some of the bacteria do not have catalysts. Some of the bacteria don't have both. Some of them have a high level or low level. Therefore, we have a different category. Okay? So once you know these, 
Then you go back to read the slides. You're going to understand a little bit better. So let's see all these. Uh, obligate arrows, which is completely needs oxygen for growth, like Cetomonas we mentioned. We'll do this in the lab. Facultative anaerobes. That means you can grow with without oxygen, grow better with oxygen. This is lots of the example, like Salmonella, E. coli, Listeria. Most of the pathogen is facultative anaerobe. That's a reason, another challenge for, for the industry. Because otherwise, we do vacuum package, we take out all the oxygen, they're going to die, is that right? It's not going to happen because they're all facultative anaerobe. Now, of course, without oxygen, they grow slow. Not as good as with oxygen. Okay, how about arrow tolerant anaerobes? These terminology, I will say, it's just like people added us up. I mean, they grow equally well without, without oxygen. Okay, they do a growth curve with, without oxygen. They said it's the same. So that's why we say it's auto tolerant. Remember tolerant, what it means tolerance? We can tolerate oxygen. That's why auto tolerant arrow tolerant anaerobe grow equally well with, without oxygen. Now obligate anaerobes, we all say streak anaerobes, does not tolerate oxygen, dies in the presence, like prostrate, like prostrate. Last one, this is a good example for the micro aerophiles. They need a limited amount of oxygen. Once the oxygen, temp oxygen amount is a little bit higher, they're gonna go into die. What are the good example of the microalophilic? Cabula vector. This is a big challenge for poultry industry. Another one is someone that we will mention later on in the examination form. Cabula vector is a microalophilus. This is usually we need to grow them in a specific jar. In the jar, we will put a diaper there. I call it a gas diaper. Or some people say gas generator. So we'll control the jaw, the oxygen is between 2 to 10%. Once the oxygen is more than 20%, it's going to go into that. That's called the micro allophiles. Okay, limited amount of the oxygen. Okay, so this is the amount of the um, requirements for the oxygen. Okay, so here comes something. How are we going to grow anaerobic bacteria? Very simple. If you are very rich, go buy these anaerobic chambers. Twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars, you can get one. Okay. But like us in the lab, what we're gonna do? We're gonna use a jaw. Okay, a jaw like that. We know we don't have a chamber, so we do a jaw. Uh, this type of chamber in the school, like uh, in the south part of the United States, like Auburn, Mississippi 